I just wanted to welcome everybody here for this uh, Invasive Species webinar for trail volunteers. I just wanted to thank you all for signing on and for being a part of this and, and learning about what you can do to help uh, protect our native habitats. I just wanted to go over what today's agenda was going to be. Um, it'll be a dual presentation between myself, Brent Boscarino. I am the Invasive Species Citizen Science Coordinator with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, and Dr. Linda Rowleader, um, who will also be speaking later. Um, that, and uh, we'll, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, today's agenda we're going to cover in part one, just do an overview of the trail conference. A lot of the people that I've noticed that are signed up for this, this is their first webinar with us uh, for this year. So I wanted to give a little bit of an overview of the trail conference, what the Lower Hudson Prism does, and, and just what invasive species are uh, and their ecology and the importance of context of the great work you guys are doing and will continue to do for our trails. We'll then get into um, you know, whether to, uh, how, how to make decision, uh, how to make decisions in terms of whether to remove or not to remove invasive species when you're out there and maintaining your trails, and just what the different decision making processes are in invasive species management in general. And then we'll get into identifying the six common invasive species that are found typically around our trail systems and some of the best management practices for removal by our trail volunteers. So I'll do a combination of both IDs and then removal procedures and uh, integrate those together within the presentation. So it'll be a little bit of a combination between um, PowerPoint slides, which I'll be introducing, as well as some field ID videos. So you guys can get a look for what it looks like out in nature. And then we'll get into part four, which is how to report your work and getting into some additional resources to help you guys out while you're out on the trails and doing, doing the great work that you do. And just a reminder for those of you who signed on late, uh, we are a packed house tonight. So please remember to stay muted to avoid a lot of the background noise in the webinar. But we have an open chat box and Linda is here to help while I'm speaking. And I can also address questions in the chat box while she is speaking. So without further ado, just wanted to introduce you guys to what the Trail Conference does. Uh, we are a vo volunteer powered organization. We have over 2000 active volunteers who work with us. This includes over 9,000 members and 75 different organizations. It's pretty amazing to think about all the people that come together to work to protect our uh, native habitats and to maintain trails um, and make the outdoor experience enjoyable for public use. Uh, our volunteers dedicate over 10,000 volunteer hours annually for our parks. This includes uh, managing and maintaining over 2,000 miles of trails. And many of you guys on this call actively do this. We're talking about the AT, Highlands Trail, Long Path, so many amazing trails that we have at our disposal and uh, are, are great to get outdoors and enjoy nature. This includes over 190 different parks and nature reserves. Um, in terms of what the trail conference does, I'm sure many of you guys on this call know that we help to develop, build, and maintain trails. So a lot of what we've done historically is to do that. Uh, we protect open space lands through a variety of different support avenues and advocacy as well, in addition to trail maintenance and building. And we do a lot of education and outreach in the public, uh, for the public in responsible use of the trails and uh, managing our natural environment and enjoying our natural environment. But I think a, a, a lot of people may not know that we also, as a trail conference, coordinate the regional response to invasive species. And we do that through a partnership called a PRISM. So that is a big acronym that basically stands for Partnership for Regional Invasive Species Management. There are eight different cooperative partnerships in New York State. You can see those here. And where our jurisdiction is, is in the Lower Hudson Prism region, so southeastern New York. Um, but each of these partnerships needs to be hosted by a nonprofit. So our PRISM and generating and, and coordinating that regional invasive species management response has to be done you know, uh, through an, an organization. And the trail conference is the host for the Lower Hudson Prism. Uh, the PRISMs are funded by the New York State DC via the Environmental Protection Fund. And just to get you guys a closer look as to what the PRISM is and where, where it is, we uh, help to manage that invasive species response all the way from New York City all the way up to Dutchess and Ulster County. You can see the outlines of this. 
But because we're hosted by the New York New Jersey Trail Conference, we do a lot of invasive species work in northern New Jersey as well. So a lot of the trails that the trail conference maintains and um, oversees, we also do a lot of invasive species work in those areas of New Jersey as well. So just because the prism is New York specific, we do a lot of our work in invasive species management in northern New Jersey as well. Um, like I said, that P in prism stands for partners and we, this is over 50 regional partners that come together. And these are people that are just interested in protecting our native habitats. These Sometimes these are individuals that own their own property or they're members of different environmental organizations or organizations that care about our forests and access to public lands. Um, we have a, also a full-time staff that's housed at the trail conference, including myself and Linda, who you'll hear from later. And just, I just wanted to give a shout out to this group because they're an amazing, great group to work with and you can see a picture that we took last year of all the partners coming together for these meetings that we have. In terms of what we do as a prism, a lot of what we do is removing and controlling invasive species and we do that within our forests um, or terrestrially but also we have an aquatic team that also manages invasive species and does removal and controls as you can see in this picture here. Um, we also help to coordinate and prioritize the invasive species response so again, we have a um, conservation core crew. This is a picture of some of them from last year in 2019. Um, this is part of AmeriCorps program. And then we also have volunteers that come out, volunteers like you that, that help us with removals as well. We also have a pretty robust surveying and mapping program. We do surveying of lakes in the region, but also our forest and trail areas and natural areas and looking for invasive species in the area. We do a lot of teaching and informing. This is a picture of me working with a school group. Uh, here's uh, another picture that we do with outreach with high schools and different educational institutions. Our aquatics team does a lot of outreach uh, with boaters and public users of, of lakes and other waterways in our region. And then we also do a lot of outreach uh, through these sorts of webinars and doing a lot of teaching and informing. This is a picture of years past of our invasive strike force survey program and teaching people how to recognize and ID uh, invasive plants. Before we get too much farther into invasive species and what you can do as trail maintainers and volunteers to help with the invasive species response, I just wanted to define a few terms for you. So you might see these thrown around uh, like in, in reading or, or hearing us talk, but a non-native species just means that it's, it's a species that is from another region that is moved to this area and, and it's, it's through people that are moving it. So just because you know, a non-native species is here, it doesn't necessarily make it invasive. So to be non-native, it just means that it's moved from an area in which it hasn't evolved for thousands, if not millions of years, and then brought to that area, like our ecosystems here in Northern New Jersey, Lower Hudson Valley, and brought there by, by people. This could be cultivated, uncultivated, but to be considered truly invasive, it, needs that it, it means that it must be harmful in some way to humans or the environment, that it's escaped our human control. And we often think about it as a stewardship team in terms of ecological damage, where an invasive species is a non-native species that significantly impacts and displaces native species or those that have been evolving and living in these habitats for a long time. Some of these invasives can begin as hitchhikers. And I give the example of the dreaded stink bug, which is all over my property in my own house. Um, as an example, these were accidentally introduced into the US from, from China or Japan, most likely on shipping crates that they just hitchhiked over on their way over here in around 1998. Um, as you know, stink bugs feed on a wide array of uh, different agricultural crops. They have these little mouthpieces that they insert into anything that's juicy and they suck out the juices of it. And the problem, even if it's introduced by accident in the case of a stink bug, we're talking about devastation to agriculture and to our forests. So these cause the fruit to rot and, um, and we're talking about a hundred different species of fruits and, and different species that um, the stink bug can feed on. In 2010 in Pennsylvania, the stink bug itself caused over $37 million in apple crop damage. You can see that even a non-native species that was introduced just by accident can wreak uh, not only like environmental harm, but also economic harm as well. 
but some are introduced on purpose. Like the invasive species we're gonna be talking about today, a lot of them started as ornamental plants that were brought over here because, well, quite frankly, they're pretty or have some sort of features that people like to look at. So invasive barberry, which, um, which we'll be talking about today, multiflora rose, oriental bittersweet, these were brought over either because of the color of their berries or the beautiful flowers. You might have seen multiflora rose blooming in your area, of these nice white flowers that were blooming. But when they escape your property and get out into natural areas and into the environment, they can wreak real a lot, a lot of ecological damage and economic harm as well. In terms of how invasive species spread, so just because you take an ornamental plant, like say barberry, it was used as a hedge for in a lot of properties, or like, you know, multiflora rose, for example, which has these beautiful flowers, how does it actually get out into natural areas? Well, it depends on the species, right? I mean, a lot of the ornamental plants we'll be talking about today have berries that are, that are eaten and then dispersed by birds. Some of them will have seeds that can be dispersed uh, through water or wind, or they have these root systems where they can basically just a little bit of a fragment of seeds of these invasive plants can break off and then grow into a new plant in an entirely different area, maybe hitchhiking on boots or your clothing. You're in one area and, we, and you don't cli uh, clean off the seeds and then move to another area of the forest, you might be spreading those seeds. So I just wanna make the point that just because you don't see a plant, that you planted on your property, you have on your property spreading all, all over your place or wherever you're seeing it, doesn't mean that it's not being moved by animals or another way and having quote unquote babies in a whole nother area or natural area. And this is essentially what happens when they escape. So here's a good look at like Oriental bittersweet, right? A lot of people use it for wreaths and Christmas wreaths around the holiday times or put it around pergolas. But what ends up happening, a bird might eat these seeds fly to a different area or a natural area like you're seeing here and cause this vast devastation. I mean, this is bittersweet, completely overtaking a tree to the point where, you know, it's very hard for that tree to survive. Photosynthesis is severely limited, nutrients and resources. So in terms of how those invasive plants that we'll be talking about today can cause environmental harm, well, number one, they take up space and resources that native species need. They're outcompeting them in some way. So it means that these plants that we're gonna be talking about today or any invasive species, whether it's a stink bug, invasive insect or a plant, they found a niche or some way that they've inserted themselves into this new ecosystem and are taking advantage of it and are crowding out a lot of our natives. Here's a good look at Japanese stilkgrass, which we'll be talking about later. And many of you guys might've seen out on the trails as trail maintainers, just totally overtaking a forest understory or kudzu which is an emerging uh, invasive species in New York State, which just blankets and covers uh, a lot of our native species, not allowing for growth beneath it. Invasive species, the reason why they're so success successful is the vast majority of them can tolerate a variety of different habitat conditions. They found a way to grow and reproduce rapidly, whether that's by producing a lot of seeds or like a really high germination re rate, or they have found ways of evolving so that animals and other ways of dispersal allows those seeds to move far and wide. A lot of them also have a lack of natural enemies or predators in their new ecosystem. So they're moved to this new area. Maybe predators or things that might be feeding on it can't recognize it as a food resource. A lot of them have low susceptibility to disease or what, or what we call as generalists. They just generally adapt to a wide and a variety of different environmental conditions. So a lot of people ask me, okay, so what the invasives or non-natives are here? Why should I care about natives? I mean, it's a plant, it's photosynthesizing, so what's the big deal? Well, it's a pretty clear answer to this actually. Native plants, it's well known that support a more diverse wildlife than, than the invasives that are coming in and crowding them out. Most of the species of native insects, including a lot of the butterflies that a lot of the gar master gardeners that I end up working with that, that love, um, are adapted to really just eat the native plants. They've been evolving and co-evolving together for thousands of years, if not, even, if not more. And the majority of plant-eating insects in our region and our ecosystems are specialized to three or fewer of those plants. I'll give you an example of the monarch butterfly, right? A classic pollinator and one that we love to protect and see on these vast migrations from Mexico all the way up to the Northeast. Well, they only feed on native milkweeds. 
So, you know, by eliminating and having these invasives come in, say like black swallowwort, uh, and out-competing a lot of our natives, it really impacts the, the insects and pollinators in our region as well. So not only are these plants that are coming in kind of out-competing some of our native plants, but it's also having an impact up through the food web and up through trophic levels. So, and we've seen this not just in our region, but we've seen this globally as well, that insect populations have declined over 75% over the last three decades worldwide. So this goes for butterflies as well as beetles and a lot of the insects that do a lot of the pollination, but also serve as a food resource for those even higher. So, you know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of you on the call today may be birders and enjoy seeing a lot of our native birds visit bird feeders or, you know, whatever, but they also feed on these insects as well. So the end result of this is not only are you getting kind of these plants that are displacing our native plants, but you're having an ecosystem-wide effect. So the IUCN, which is the International Union Conservation of Nature, uh, publishes what is called a red list. And it's a basically a comprehensive inventory of global conservation status of a lot of the species. And they're kind of like look at biodiversity globally. IAS, um, uh, basically standing for invasive species, uh, is the second biggest driver of species extinction, according to the IUCN, who generates, who's sort of the go-to resource on this. Um, that drives you know, local extinctions and species extinction in the world. And it's even worse on islands. So this is a big global issue, um, not just in our own ecosystems and, and forests here in the Northeast. Um, and even if you're not into the environmental side of things, as I mentioned before with the stink bug, there are huge losses economically to not getting around and helping to control and manage invasive species and letting, letting them get established and not controlling them. Um, so these are big losses to forestry, agriculture, tourism, and we love our parks. I mean, that's why we do what we do, is we love enjoying those public spaces and that it should be free and available to all. But when they're infringing upon, you know, the, the tra our trail systems and our natural areas, we can have huge economic costs, agriculture as well. And here in the United States, we far surpass in terms of management um, and control costs here in the U.S. versus some other areas of the world. I mean, you look at $120 billion a year spent on invasive species management and control. So just to summarize, our overall goal is essentially to protect our native habitats and our species. So here to the right, I hope you can see my arrow here, that's a really invaded ecosystem there. But what we're hoping to do is bring back, say, like a maple leaf viburnum and you know spotted geranium and those those um you know native species that we love seeing while we're out hiking and enjoying our trails but it's not just about the plants right it's about what the plants provide for other species as well it's an ecosystem based approach so protecting and saving our native hemlocks makes a big difference to say brook trout and you know the shade they provide for our streams or protecting salamanders and making sure that they have enough leaf litter and uh, you know the, the forest soil is intact for them or bluebirds or monarchs as we talked about and as it goes up through the food web. So that's our overall goal as, as a team and an invasive team and what we want out of our stewardship programs and to, to, to enjoy our natural areas uh, for what they are. In terms of where the trail conference fits into all of this and how that relates to the lower Hudson prism, I come back to the idea of what is called citizen science or community-based science. And that is a buzzword I'm sure you guys have heard or if you, if you uh, subscribe to our newsletters, I'm sure you've heard me talk about, it. and that is my job in the citizen science coordinator. These are essentially projects that involve real world discussions and data sharing between volunteers like yourselves and trail maintainers or other trail volunteers like our surveyors and experts or other, other organizations that can provide feedback and you're working together, working towards a common goal. In this case, to protect our native habitats. That's what citizen science is, a data sharing and a dialogue between volunteers and sort of a scientific community, so to speak. And what I urge you all to do and what's so exciting about this work and hopefully why you're on the call today is that these are global issues. I outlined, you know, biodiversity crisis globally, but this is happening in our local ecosystems as well. So think about those issues globally and hopefully the reason why you're here is you want to do something. You want to give back. And that's what I think is amazing about citizen science is that you can think about these big issues and then act on them locally. 
And our volunteers uh, across the board have been amazing. And what you, the, I'm sure many of you on this call today are trail maintainers, the amazing work that you do. And now let's see if we can synergize that connection between what we do as a stewardship team and the trail maintainers and how, you, how we all can work together to make a difference. So the Trail Conferences Invasive Program has a few goals. As, I, as I've made clear, it's to preserve our natural areas and forests that we love to hike in and enjoy, of course. To preserve the biodiversity or the types of species that we find in this area and protect those native species. And it's also to prevent our trail systems, which you guys are working on and with, as serving as what are we called vectors or avenues of invasion. So we have a lot of people that are moving through our trails and enjoying the outdoors in this trail system. So how do we protect those regions from not being overcrowded and overrun by invasive species, but actually make a difference to do something to protect and keep those ecosystems intact? And it's a multi-step process, of course, that involves a lot of different trail volunteers. Here's a snapshot of just some of those, our Conservation Corps, and some of our surveyors last year all working together as a team. Well, the first part of this team, or at least one part of it, are the Invasive Strike Force Volunteer Surveyors. So a lot of the programs that I run through Citizen Science are basically training people in the IDs of a lot of the different invasive plants that we find common along our trails. The data that they go out and collect is then used to generate maps of where invasive species are, prioritize regions for removal or some sort of like management objective, and then they share that data, you know, obviously with us or other different management agencies and scientists so that we can then prioritize what that response is gonna be. And here's a look at some of those surveyors who do an amazing job for us. And we're talking, remember, we're talking about over 2,000 miles of trails that the trail conference is a part of. This requires a monumental effort from our, from our volunteers to do that. We have a couple of different programs uh, through the Invasive Strike Force. The standard one is more for beginners where you'll learn to identify and then report on 14 common invasive species. The ones that we're gonna be talking about today for trail volunteers and trail maintainers, six of those out of those 14 we'll be talking about today. Then once you kind of get the hang of it and, and know your plant IDs a little bit more, you'll then can move on to an intermediate survey where we'll talk about 11 less common or what we call emerging species that are infringing upon our trails and natural areas. And then again, those two are really along our trail system, but then we have a blockbuster program where it's a little more scientific, where we're comparing what types of invasive species are we finding at trailheads versus like in highly impacted areas, like around parking lots versus like, you know, you're deep into a trail and you've been hiking for a while in a, in a really kind of pristine area. What invasives are infringing upon those areas and why? How are they getting there? Answering questions like that. And I just wanted to say that 2019 was like a really a banner year for our programs. We had over 133 volunteer surveyors, survey over 200 miles. And this is a lot of survey hours put together and a lot of plants that are recorded. And we're getting a really good sense of what we're finding and what we're up against and battling against along our trail system. Here's a look at some of the interns that worked with me last year as part of this invasive strike force. But I do wanna mention why the work that we're gonna be talking about today is so critical, even though we have surveyors on the field, it takes about six years to cycle through all the trails again. So by you as trail maintainers being out there, you are on the forefront of maintaining these trails and are so critical to trail health. By you keeping an eye out for it and helping with some of the removals, it makes everybody's kind of teamwork and effort work put, put together like even more incredible, right? So that's what we're hoping is to sort of synergize these efforts. And our ISF volunteers essentially make it possible. You can look at a, a data sheet of how we're recording and surveying uh, what our surveyors do. But this again identifies how invasive plants will travel, uh, what to do with removals, and how to protect the intact or nearly intact areas that we're working with. So with that, that's sort of a context for the programs. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Linda Rolleder, who's gonna to talk to you a little bit about how you choose those projects and what to do when we are removing invasive species and what your roles in that can be. So I'm gonna go on mute. Take over Linda and introduce yourself. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Linda Rolleder. I'm the Director of Land Stewardship at the Trail Conference. And I oversee the, uh, the invasive species programs and am coordinator for the Lower Hudson Prism. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a picture of an infestation in Sterling Forest. 
uh, some of you may be maintainers there. This uh, picture on the left was taken in 2009, and the picture on the right was taken last year after our crews have been working on that for several years. Um, this is a, a new invasive species that uh, is only found in a few spots in our area. Uh, next slide, Brent. Um, so I want to show you a little bit about what we can get from our uh, volunteers that are surveying along the trails. Uh, on the left is Scunamuck Mountain, uh, that's in Orange County, New York. And what you're seeing in the colored dots, the blue dots represent an invas uh, observation point that the surveyor did not find any invasives at that point. The green dot represents where they found only a few, and the yellow, they found some, the orange, they found many, and the red was very extensive. So we can get a look from just from that kind of data collection that Scunamuck Mountain on the left is fairly uninvaded, but this picture of Sterling Forest on the right is a lot more invaded. But if you look at the trail that goes up to the left on Sterling For the Sterling Forest map, you'll see there's a lot of blue on that trail. And that tells us that that area of the park is likely to be less invaded than the rest, er rest of the park. So that tells us that might be the area that we want to protect. Um, and if we look at the Scunamuck Mountain one, we see that a lot of the invasives are clustered around the entrances uh, near the roads. And so we look at these sort of random spots uh, that show up along the trail where it's been you know, maybe a mile that you've hiked in and there's nothing and then there's a green spot. And that's the area we wanna go and try to remove. Um, so it helps us target where we're going to try to do removals to, to help protect the natural areas. Okay, next, Brent. So this is an example of one of the areas. This is out at Delaware Water Gap, and what you're looking at in the map there is the Delaware River up in the, um, the upper left-hand corner, uh, Old Mine Road. And you'll see the red dots there near the road. As you climb the, uh, the ridge up to the Appalachian Trail, um, you'll see that that trail is almost completely clean. We get up to the intersection with the Appalachian Trail and there's some orange and yellow dots there. Um, you know, get up, I'm talking about gain in elevation, but on your map, it's the lower trail. Um, so what we would do is we would go out and scout in that instance and say, okay, what invasive species is here? And is that something that goes further out past the trail and it's maybe just the edge of a really big infestation or is it simply along the trail? And if it's simply along the trail, we know that that's something that we can actually do something about and we can prevent it from spreading. And we know that this is Appalachian Trail. Everybody's probably familiar with Appalachian Trail. It goes from Maine to Georgia, right? So if we can prevent this invasive species from taking off in this spot, we can prevent it from being tracked all up and down the East Coast, um, at least along that Appalachian Trail. Uh, so this is what we saw, this picture. And what you see along the sides of the trail are garlic mustard in bloom. That's the about foot tall plant with white flowers on it. And we realized that this was something we could remove. So we had a volunteer work day there and we went out and removed it. You'll see the after picture. And to the uninitiated, you may say, oh, well, now it looks bare, right? But actually what you see there are little tiny seedlings of native plants. And by removing the garlic mustard, now we're able to give those native plants room to grow. And in fact, when we went back afterwards, we did see that it was filling in with native plants. Okay, next. 
Um, so I want to interject a note of caution here. You know, we want to protect native habitats, but all of our removal projects have to have achievable goals. Um, what we're looking here at here in the picture is frag, uh, native, fra I'm not a native, uh, invasive Phragmites stand. And this is pretty extensive. Uh, not one person is not going to be able to take care of this. So you really need to have something achievable. And that's why we choose the less invaded places to work on first, because then we can actually protect the native habitat that exists there and we can actually achieve what we set out to do. Um, the invasive plants also may offer habitat where none other exists. Like in this Phragmites stand, this might have replaced a very diverse native wetland, but if we were to simply remove the Phragmites without trying to replace that native wetland, we could be removing valuable habitat. And this is relevant for us, for trail maintainers that work in uh, Dutchess and Putnam County, New York, where we have the endangered New England cottontail rabbits. They use the rose thickets and without native roses, they are using multiflora rose, which is an invasive. So if we were to go remove those multiflora rose bushes, now suddenly the rabbits, which are endangered native species, would not have a place to live. Um, so this is another reason why you focus on areas that are um, minimally invaded first. Okay. All right, next. Okay, so we put together a method for prioritizing where we're going to do removals. And the reason I'm introducing this is because this same method can be used by you on your trail when you're trying to decide whether you're going to do a removal or not, okay? So first of all, we prioritize the invasive plants based on how widespread they are. Um, we've put together a method that's used across the state of New York by all of the different prisms. And it allows managers to select removal projects with achievable goals, and it allows us to set expectations both at a local level and a regional level. Um, so all the day, all the plants in today's program are considered widespread species, and I'm going to explain what how that uh, fits in here in a minute. So just remember that what we're what we're going to be teaching you are considered widespread. Okay, so next. So the, the prioritization system that we put together is the tier one species is something that isn't here yet. It's a, it's a harmful invasive, but it hasn't yet reached this region. Again, think about this as if you were gonna apply it to your trail, okay? Um, anything that is not there on your trail yet, you would focus on surveying for it and eradicate it once you detect it. That way you do not let it get established. Okay, so the, you get it when it's small. Okay, next. So tier two are emerging invasive species. These are invasives that are just starting to become established in localized areas. They're not everywhere, they are just a few spots and there may be small enough spots or few enough spots that we actually can get rid of them. Um, so for those, we focus on eradicating them. And if we can't eradicate it, we're gonna contain it. And that means getting rid of large individuals that are producing seeds or working on the boundaries and tying a noose around those boundaries. Okay. All right, next. So tier three is established invasives. So tier three are things that have established here where there's probably too much of it for us to completely get rid of it. But it's not everywhere. Um, you know, maybe it's not in the neighboring county or the neighboring municipality. 
so we could protect that area by focusing on the boundary of the infestation that's nearest that area. Okay. Uh, so that, the focus then is on containment. So contain the, the infestation and prevent it from spreading to new areas that don't have it yet. Okay. Next. And then finally, there's tier four. Tier four are species that are everywhere throughout the region. Um, you know, there, if, even if we were to remove it in a certain park, chances are it would come back because it's all in the surrounding areas. Okay, in that case, you're never gonna eradicate it, but you can protect uninvaded areas by making sure that you, you uh, exclude it from those areas or that um, you don't let it spread into the areas where it hasn't gotten to yet. Okay, so that's the widespread species. So that's our tier system. And it's something that you can apply at a state level, at a county level, at a municipality level, at a park level, or even at your trail level, okay? So if you look at your trail and you find out what's on there, then you classify it. Um, is it tier two? It's small enough that I could actually remove it and get it off of my trail. Tier three. It's established here, but it's not all the way along the trail, and maybe I could contain it. Or tier far, hey, it's everywhere along the trail. Maybe it's not, you know, the thing I should be focusing on. Okay, so why involve trail maintainers in doing removals? Um, first of all, I want to say that we're not saying to trail maintainers that this should be part of your job. What we are saying is that if you would like to go further, this is another way that you can take care of your trail. Um, maintainers can provide critical care and observations about invasive species on your trail. Uh, as Brent mentioned, our invasive surveyors only get to each section of trail about every five to six years or so. Um, and so you can be the, the early eyes on the ground to notice when something is starting to appear on your trail. Um, and invasive plants from trail maintainers, when you're maintaining your trail, you are focused on clipping to maintain that corridor open. But invasive plants need to be treated differently than other plants. Often, you want to cut them all the way down to the ground. So knowing what invasive plants are and how to recognize them so that you can take that additional step will help you with your trail maintenance activities. Um, many invasive plants, if you cut them, they, it stimulates a regrowth response. So they grow more. So it's better to cut them all the way to the ground than to simply clip branches. Um, so before we get into identifying the plants, I want to uh, sort of set your expectations and give you the questions that you should be asking yourself when you're looking at an invasive species on your trail. Is this plant impairing the trail's use? Okay. Um, how big is, in the, is the infestation? Where does it fit on that tier category? Can I reasonably remove it with the tools and the time that I have, okay? I don't encourage you to take on projects that are unreasonable, okay? Uh, many invasive species are very persistent and they can, they can invade large areas very quickly and they can be very difficult to get control over. Um, so we want you to be successful in the efforts that you take on. So I want you to, you know, be practical in the decision about what you're going to remove. The other question you should ask is, will removing that plant cause erosion? Uh, if so, you may not want to remove it okay. um, because of, of er additional problems that could be caused 
by removing. And then the other question, is this plant damaging other plants? And this specifically applies to vines on trees. So maybe the vine isn't causing a big problem for the trail use. Um, maybe it's small enough that you think you could handle it. Should you take it on? Well, it may be more important to take care of it if it appears to be damaging a tree that is along the trail that could then become a hazard, fall across the trail, become a bigger problem if you don't take care of the vine. Okay. So these are some of the questions you should keep in mind. Okay. What can you do? Okay, what can you do as a trail maintainer? You can kill properly identified invasive plants. Okay. So I'm, I'm emphasizing that. Make sure that you know how to identify it. There are some lookalikes. It would be not a good thing if you were uh, out there trying to remove invasive plants and you ended up removing natives. So make sure you know how to identify the plants properly. Uh, you can uh, you can also you can cut within the trail corridor. Typically, cutting within the trail corridor falls within your permissions as a trail maintainer. No additional permission is needed. However, for treatment outside of the trail corridor, almost always you're going to need additional permission from the park and you should contact your trail supervisor um, or us at Invasives at NYJ, uh, NYJ <laughs> I can't say it, uh, New York, New Jersey Trail Conference.org for assistance. Your supervisor should be able to assist you. Um, occasionally, we've dealt with a lot of park managers to get permission to remove invasives. So if your supervisor uh, isn't, uh, un isn't sure, who to talk to about getting permission for invasives, uh, we can assist with that. Um, but your first choice should be to talk to your supervisor ab about getting permissions for removing outside of the trail quarter. Okay, so this is a slide from the trail maintenance, uh, intro to trail maintenance presentation, uh, where the trail corridor is. And so that area is the area that you can work in without additional permissions. But if you wanna go outside of that, make sure to check with your supervisor, make sure that you're okay to do it with the park manager. Okay. Right, next, um, what to bring. This slide is also from the introduction to trail maintenance. Um, typically you bring a handsaw, loppers, gloves, eye protection. Um, what we've added in, garbage bags or, uh, garbage bags for collecting up certain invasive species uh, that you did, wouldn't want to leave on the trail. Um, a tarp, a tarp can be useful if you're doing a bigger project and you need to move what you remove off of the trail so you can load everything onto the tarp and then you can drag it somewhere else. And finally, a boot brush. A boot brush can simply be a clean scrub brush and this is to use to clean any seeds off of your pants or shoes or the bottom of your uh, of the treads of your hiking boots. Um, seeds can be in mud. Uh, you can also have other insects and things in mud. So that's if you're trying to prevent spread of invasives, you also need to make sure that you're not the cause, uh, that you're not tr uh, tracking seeds along the trail. So that's why we recommend a boot brush. Okay, so next I think Brent is going to tell you how to identify these six species that we think uh, you might like to take on on your trails. Hi guys, I'm back. Thanks Linda. Um, yes, we're going to get into the six different species. I know many of you who are on previous webinars with me for the survey program have seen a lot of this, but a lot of you guys are going to be new to this. And so I'll do a little bit of a combination of some slides in addition to some field videos. So let's get to it. Our first one is Japanese Barbary. So Japanese Barbary, I'm sure many of you have seen along the trails when you're out and about. It's a deciduous compact thorny shrub 
which is identified by its arching branches. To me, it looks like a crazy hairdo, almost like mine now, because I haven't got my hair cut in so many months. Um, and it also has very small spoon-shaped leaves, conspicuous spines, which I'll show you in the video coming up, and these oval-shaped red berries. Red berries in general are a good indication that you might be looking at an invasive, or at least like might want to look closer. Um, in terms of its region for invasion success and its impact, um, it's rugged, it's versatile, just like many of the invasive species. It can, uh, it's adapted to a lot of different soils, sun, shade, and sun uh, conditions. It's also disease resistant and not a lot of natural controls, like deer, for example, tend to stay away from barberry. Um, it's got sharp thorns, make it uncomfortable to eat and digest. Um, its berries are widely dispersed by animals. Um, and you know but they're of like really low nutritional value and may actually negatively impact uh, a lot of bird growth and survival um, it can reproduce by vegetative propagation meaning that it, it not just by seed but just by by fragments or if you leave like roots behind after pulling it it can actually sprout up again um, it also like many like many invasives it leafs out or basically shows its leaves early in the season and then stays on for longer in the season, which basically means that it has a long period of growth, a really long growing season. Um, and it's got persistent berries. It's a really high reproductive output. Uh, some reports have, you know, 12,000 seeds for a single plant and a 90% germination rate. So like those seeds drop or they're brought to another place by birds. So, you know, it's got a high likelihood of establishing. And many of you guys know they are harborers of ticks. So, these areas provide a humid buffered climate that increase tick survival. And so we've got to be careful in these areas and it's something else that we want to kind of keep an eye on and stay away from. The best way I can show you for ID is to actually take a look at a video that I took in the field. Now this is from uh, April, I think, but uh, a, lot of the, the, a lot of the key identifying features are going to be the same. So this is going to come through my computer speaker, so it's going to sound a little tinny. It might jump a little bit, but, it, but it's enough to get the good idea of like what you'll be looking at and what you're going to be looking for. Because really, when you're out in the field, it's a much different picture than when what you see with like a still picture. So I think these field ID videos are important. First, let's take a look at these branches that I had mentioned before. So again, if you can see this almost flat, very thin spoon-shaped leaves that run along these branches, and you can start to see that there are little flower buds that are starting to appear. This video is being taken in mid-April, but by May, you'll start to see these almost whitish or uh, yellowish flowers that's so they're pretty much done flowering by now, but again, you might, you might see these come out next year or something, you might see it. So it's important to see what they look like in different seasons. But right now you're looking for the leaves and also these thorns, which I'll talk about in a second, start to come. And they tend to come out by these little leaf clusters here. Um, another thing that I wanted to point out is that usually by the uh, end of the summertime, you'll start to see these berries, these red berries appear, and these are actually lasting from last year. So these red berries are more oval in shape and um, tend to be more elongated than some of the other ones that we'll see uh, in terms of lookalikes. And if we can get a close look at what these thorns look like, you see how they go straight up and they almost look like toothpicks? And you can get an idea for scale of both of these things from, from my hand and, and fingernail next to it, right? But almost like these very, very thick, sharp ones that had to, uh, sharp thorns that appear at the end of the leaf clusters. So that just gives you a, a, a general look at that. The only other thing I wanted to point out is if you take a look at the base of this, zoom into the base of this, there are multiple um, stems that are arising on this just this one plant and again you know because it's so dense in the middle you know these harbor are lots of ticks so I got to be careful to check myself afterwards and small mammals and rodents tend to use this as a uh, cover which again you know provides hosts for some of these ticks so these are some of the key features and again taking a look at, at the at the arching branches and that almost like wild look to it um, and we'll look, take a look at some of the, the lookalikes in the area. But again, you're looking for the sharp thorns at the base, the spoon-shaped, almost spatula, very thin leaves, and those arching branches.
Okay, so that's our first invasive species. So we'll go back to the PowerPoint here and then kind of just a little quick review for you. Um, small spoon shaped leaves, uh, they'll be in different colors. This is what the flowers would look like um, if they're coming out, but again, it's done flowering for now. And those thorns, those like little, I think of them like toothpicks because we're about to do multi floor rows and the, and the thorns actually look quite different. So uh, just as something to be mindful of and, and take a look for. I'm gonna turn it over to Linda now, who looks like she might be answering a chat question to talk about the management. So you find barberry, right? You see these little toothpick like things and the arching branches, what do you do with it? So um, for small plants, uh, you can pull them out. Uh, you do have to be careful of the thorns. The, uh, be sure to wear very thick leather gloves. Uh, and even then, the, the, those thorns can pierce right through. So you want to reach down to the bottom of the plant near the ground. There are fewer thorns at the base and pull out uh, the plant. This is for small plants. Um, you, they will usually come out fairly well. Um, and what do we do with them? We typically shake the soil off of the roots and pile them on rocks off the trail. Um, basically what you want to do is you want to get the roots up in the air uh, so that they dry out. Uh, you do not want to pile these on the ground, directly on the ground, because they can reroot if they're in contact with the ground. Uh, for large plants, like what Brent was showing you in the video, you want to cut it close to the ground, but how do you get in there with all of those branches, uh, you know, spreading out? So there's a couple of techniques that you can use. One is you can use a stick or a board to press the, the, uh, the branches forward and allow you to get in to the base of the plant and cut the stems. You can also use a rope to wrap around the plant and pull it to the side while another person cuts. So you can uh, cut close to the ground. You can also use a rock bar for those of you that do stonework. It's a, a long metal bar with sort of a chisel tip to sort of lever the plant out. Uh, that's a little bit more physical. It does a little bit more um, uh, damage or not damage, uh, disturbance to the ground. So make sure that you evaluate the erosion potential if you're gonna do that. Um, when to manage Japanese barberry? You want to try to do it before the seeds develop. That's usually late fall. Uh, the berries are ripe when they're red. If they're still green, you're okay. You can still manage. Um, the reason we want to do it before the seeds develop is because you don't want to be dragging around the, be the bushes that you removed and potentially those berries are falling off and spreading around. Um, if you do end up doing removal uh, when there's still seeds, then at least just sort of concentrate everything together in a pile and try not to move it outside of where uh, the infestation is. Uh, so if removal is the goal, you can do multiple cuttings each summer and that's the most effective. Winter cutting encourages new growth. So you should not do this cutting in the winter, even though it may be easier to see it at that time. Um, that just encourages the plant to put up new, new branches. Um, so that, there's some good timing things in there, All right? Next. Brent? I'm on mute. Uh -huh. Okay. There you go, uh, talking about multi-floor rows. Um, I actually gonna talk about multi-floor rows as a, as a look-alike, because a lot of people confuse it with it because they, all they know is that they're out on the trail or in their backyards and they're getting uh, hit, hit by thorns or whatever. But uh, multi-floor rose was just blooming in our area. It's probably not gonna see the white flowers anymore, but it's an invasive perennial shrub. It can grow to be about six to 10 feet tall. Um, it's white flowers again, just, just appeared, but it really can form this like impenetrably dense cluster of shrub that 
can span huge swaths of the forest. And I'm sure many of you guys have seen this along the trails that you maintain, it's very thorny. In terms of threats and impacts, it can form like really these dense monocultures with steel lights and nutrients from low lying natives. And uh, talking about it being out on the trail, you know, it, it can form these walls which are really impacting recreation and hiking access in areas if you just allow it to overgrow. And just like many invasive shrubs and uh, invasive plants, it tolerates a wide range of soil, light, moisture conditions. It tends to thrive in high light situations with well-drained soils. But again, I often see it a lot around, uh, around streams. You can see it here next to a waterway and kind of overlooking streams as well. It is uh, reasons for invasion success. It's propagation by seed and birds and, uh, and other mammals that will eat this. Um, it's, uh, it sprouts from roots and branch tips as well. It's a prolific seed producer. We're talking about up to 500,000 per year, for potentially from a single plant. And the seeds remain viable for up to 15 years. So they're very, it's very difficult to get rid of. It's dispersed by multiple animals. And just like Barber, you know, it has this early leaf out where the leaf appears early in the season and then late leaf loss. And you have these persistent fruits that will last on it as well. So I wanted to show you, I'm gonna talk about it in the video as a lookalike to barberry, because you can see the berries kind of look like, a, like barberry berries, and it's also very thorny. So how do you tell the difference? Well, let's take a quick look at it. And again, this is an earlier video in the spring, but a lot of the key features that you're gonna be look for, looking for, you'll see in this video. Japanese barberry lookalike alert. What we're looking at here is actually not Japanese barberry but multiflora rose, which is another invasive species with sort of a wild growth pattern to it. So if you're out and about and you see this almost this wildness of growth in those arching branches, it may be multiflora rose. So there's a couple of different things you can look for. Let's take a look at the berries that have persisted over the winter into the early spring here. You'll see that they are red, very similar to Japanese barberry, but they're not nearly as elongated and oval in shape. All right, so they're more, they're a little bit slightly rounded and they have like the black tips at the end, as you can see here. So that's one of the features that can, that can help distinguish it. Let's take a look at some other features about multiflora rose that are slightly different. If you take a look at the thorn, to me, that looks like the dorsal fin or, so, or of, a, uh, of a shark or something. So it's more recurved and, and kind of a curve towards the back versus Barbary, which has a very straight, almost toothpick shape to it. And if you can see behind that thorn, you see um, that there is almost what are called these fringed stipules at the base. So if you can see, uh, if I can get my finger in there. See this little fringed, almost like uh, these fringed stipules or the base of the of the leaf stalk here that connect to the to this branch here. It's got those little like hairy projections on it, or the what are called fringe. Certainly, Barberry doesn't have that, and this is the distinguishing feature of Multiflora rose. So those are some of the features that you can look for to make sure that you're looking, in fact, at Barberry and not Multiflora rose. All right, um, and I'm gonna give you a closer look at it here as to what I'm talking about with those stipules, because that's the key. To me, it looks like a, like a centipede or something, like a caterpillar, right? Those are these fringe at the base, and a lot of the, the native roses, like Carolina roses, for example, do not have that. So you're looking for that where the leaf stalk connects to that stem. That's going to be your key feature, but also just really these like these uh, curved down curved thorns like to me it's a shark fin. Um, you, we saw the flowers that were blooming already, but all of those are key features of multiflora rose and how to distinguish it from barberry. So uh, just some things to think about when you're out there. Um, just look for the difference in the thorn shape as well as these uh, the, these fringe stipules uh, as a leaf part or a part of um, you know, it's a small leaf-like appendage to uh, where the leaf stalk connects. All right, Linda, over to you. Okay, so how do you manage multiflora rose? And I, I would just say this picture here, if this is what your trail looks like, this probably is not an infestation that you want to take on. Um, <laughs> it's probably a little bit too much. Um, but for multiflora rose, you can pull or dig out small plants, move all the roots, 
Um, you can cut it to the, down to the roots and repeat as needed. Um, pruning the branches that are coming out into the trail will just stimulate it to grow more. So you do really need to cut it all the way down to the base. Um, when should you do this before the seeds ripen? Usually late in the fall. Um, and one other tip about dealing with multifloros, those hooked thorns can really grab onto you. So sometimes it's best to just take small cuts of the branches to get down to the base uh, rather than trying to reach into the base and cut it and remove the whole thing at once. Um, you could, with a long branch with lots of thorns on it, you can get tangled up and uh, hooked by those thorns fairly easily. Um, and the same cautions about removing multiflora rows about, as about removing uh, barberry. Make sure to check to see if uh, digging it out is going to cause erosion. Um, and also to make sure to deal with it before it sets seed uh, in the fall. All right, Brent. All right. Okay, I'm sure you guys have come across Oriental Bittersweet, but this is uh, now we're getting on to the vines. So the first two that we covered were shrubs or like that with multiple stems. Well, these are vines. These are things that need something else to climb on or clamor over. I've given you a lot of different like snapshots here of what you could use to look for Oriental Bittersweet. And I'm gonna take my time on the field ID video on this because I wanna make sure that you're looking at a vine of Oriental Bittersweet and not another like a native vine or something. So we'll take some time to do that. But basically, one of the things to look for is it is it a, is it a vine and is it corkscrewing up the tree? So you can see this classic like girdling and corkscrewing that's happening with Oriental Bittersweet. The roots itself, you may be pulling this out of your gardens. I know I have it in my backyard, it's orange. Um, and again, these, uh, they have what are called these leaders that I'll point out in the field video of like little snakes that are looking for purchase and to hang on to something. Or you could be looking at these fruits, which are reddish, orangish that you see over in this picture here. And they come out typically in the fall and they uh, flower, fruit and flower in the axles of the leaves or the, the sort of like where the leaf stalk hits. And there's usually two or three per cluster. But again, I think the best way to show you guys this is not only like talk about this, but I'll also show you field ID videos in a second. But essentially, I mean, when you're looking at Oriental Bittersweet, you're talking about girdling, shade, weighing down other plants and trees. Up to 10% of mature tree mortality is due to bittersweet infested areas, maybe even more depending on what region that you're in. These berries are eaten and spread by birds along trail corridors. And uh, you know the fruits that are eaten by the birds, they last a long time in birds' stomachs. So that means that they're moving them even farther away from the source. Um, and again, bittersweet has a high reproductive rate, just like a lot of our other invasive species, and can reproduce by vegetative and seed means. So again, just, just like many successful invaders, there's a lot of different ways of kind of spreading those seeds and, and creating a new generation. So I'm gonna show you a couple of different images here and pictures of Oriental Bittersweet. I took a while with this one uh, because it, it comes in a lot of variations where it looks different when it's young versus old. And so I want you guys to be able to tell what it looks like depending on its, on its growth stage. So we'll take a look here. Here's a good close-up look of the vines of Oriental Bittersweet. And the reason you can tell is it is actually a couple of different ways. You see how it's wrapping around this tree in a corkscrew fashion? So it's twisting and wrapping around almost like a python that's going up this. It's actually can even wrap around itself. You might even see these dark knobs with again, a couple of different vines that are wrapping around it itself. Also, I will notice, you will notice that it has a lot of dots on it. Now it depends on the age of that vine as to whether you'll see those but those are lenticels and ways of uh, oxygen exchange uh, in inside and outside of the vine. And uh, that's another distinguishing feature of it. You gotta look, it's, it's almost like dotted with those. Um, but again, that depends on the vine. You can see that all throughout here, but you're really looking for that corkscrew pattern. I did wanna point out that right below it is poison ivy. And again, poison ivy with the three leaves. So there's poison ivy going just below it here, but that's all that twistiness right there. That is classic of Oriental bitter 
I didn't show it in this video, but one way to tell the difference between poison ivy and oriental bittersweet is that oriental bittersweet tends to corkscrew, right? But poison ivy will meander. It might like turn a little bit, but it's like meandering like a river and it doesn't necessarily go round and round a tree. Bittersweet. We are filming this right now at the beginning of May. And you can just see, like even, even the branches that are coming out of this twisting vine here, you can see that the leaves are starting to form. And again, so this is what the leaf structure will look like. You can see that there's little teeth at the edge of the leaf. So that's, that's another classic way to look at it. So, but as this continues to grow and the growing season comes on, you can see that those leaves are growing in clusters. These will open up a bit. And I'm just looking for almost like that, that oval shaped look to it. Um, with a little like the tip at the end, whoops, it comes back into focus. Yeah, I see this got like comes kind of to a point, but you're looking for the teeth on it. So the teeth on the edge, kind of growing out of this cluster here, but it's really that wrapping around like a big python that you're looking for that distinguishes it from say poison ivy, which tends to meander or even Virginia creeper that tends to meander as well. Look for that coarse growing pattern. I also wanted to show you a younger version of bittersweet and, and what it looks like. You can see that the that the bark um, on this stem here is a little, um, it's it's like reddish brown. And you can see that the lenticels on this are, are more white or those bumps that you're seeing for um, gas exchange are white. You can see the leaf clusters again. And if you zoom in very closely, you can see that there are two little tipped points on the leaves. Okay. So when this starts growing out, you'll see that the leaves are arranged alternately as well. So they're not going to be opposite of one another um, as this begins to grow out. The other feature of the younger branches that I wanted to point out, we'll go over here. It's a little more obvious. So bittersweet, again, as a vine is looking for something to wrap around, right? In that corkscrew fashion. So what you'll often see are these things things that are called leaders. So you see how this is almost like, it's like a snake kind of perched up like a cobra looking for something. Um, so I, it's sort of like the snake-like appearance. These leaders will come off of the main, you know, the, off of the main stem um, and be looking to wrap itself around something. You can see that this bittersweet here is wrapping around itself. So uh, almost this corkscrew twisting around itself. You can see how it's all tangled. So this is what the younger version of bittersweet will look like. And I, I just pulled it off, but it was all actually about to wrap around this garlic mustard that you're seeing below me as well. So those are some of the features of the younger bittersweet. So more white lenticels, the bark is slightly different. Um, and uh, looking for these leaders, these almost like snake-like leaders that are looking for a place to wrap around. It's very nefarious. Here's another good look at those leaders I was telling you about in another part of the forest that I'm in right now. You can see those like little branches. It's actually wrapping around itself. And you see how it's that snake-like appearance uh, in the fore foreground and also the background of this plant. You know, it's totally taken over here. There's another one that's coming down. Again, looking for uh, to wrap itself around, around itself. I wanted to show you this because you might see this out on the trails where it's just like all of these just coming down and totally taken over, like say this log or whatever it is there. But it was just another good look at the leaders. I also wanted to show you uh, another part here which kind of is a tangled mess of vines and how to, how to distinguish them. It's being you know, established and then coming up and looking for purchase, but those are what the, the leaders look like. So that's another clear example of bittersweet. Here's another twisted mess. Um, how do you disentangle this, uh, the pun aside there, as to what we are looking at here? Well, a lot of it is bittersweet, but how can you tell? There's another vine in here that you may confuse it with. So again, if we're looking for the kind of the rougher bark here, looking for lenticels. This is mostly uh, bittersweet that you're seeing here. But if you come over here, you'll see that the bittersweet um, is actually wrapping itself around something that looks slightly different. So you see this shaggier bark here. I can actually so shaggy that I can peel it off. Well, this is what a grapevine looks like. They almost, uh, you'll see them in a lot of the forests around here. They almost look like Tarzan swinging types. Um, but this is what uh, the native grapevines look like. You can uh, pull off the bark, it's very stringy, okay? So this is bittersweet. Again, you can tell by the corkscrewing that it's doing around this grapevine here. Um, here's another grapevine. 
um, a small, slightly smaller version to it, but bittersweet is wrapping itself around this grapevine. A lot of what we're seeing in this picture um, is actually bittersweet. And again, I can tell by these leaves and see this, these uh, leaf buds here that are coming off. This is just really early growth, for, growth form in May, but you might confuse it with uh, grapevines, but the way to tell is that that sort of stringy bark on grapevines versus this, um, this um, you know, bittersweet, which is a little bit rougher. That tangled mess of vines that I showed you in the beginning of May, this is the same exact area now at the end of May. I just wanted to show you what has happened to this. Again, you've got bittersweet along with that, those grapevines that I showed you before. This is like literally in the same spot. You can see the growth that happens. This is just a few weeks ago I took this or like a couple, about a week and a half ago. This is what the bittersweet leaves will actually start to look like. They're much like bigger, deeper. You can clearly see the teeth at the end. Um, but just a slightly different structure from what I showed you in the original video. Um, you can see that it's starting to, you know, the, there, there's starting to be some blooms here that are going. So I just want to, I'll end it there, but you can just see the, the different growth structures of these and, um, and what it might look like when you're out there. So again, you're looking for that corkscrew appearance. Um, and that the, you know, the, the leaves themselves can look actually quite different. Some can have pointier tips, some can be more rounder like they are here when you're looking at the leaves. So just a couple of things to look for, but you're looking for the teeth or those sort of like little tooth margins or outside edges uh, of them and just looking for the coarse growing of the vine and the lenticels. All right, Linda. Okay. So oriental bittersweet is a little bit difficult to deal with. Uh, you can pull young vines up by the roots. Uh, however, it does have a very long lateral root system. So often those roots will break and then new plant, new shoots will come up from where the root broke off. Um, so, you, however, you can get control of this by repeated cutting. Uh, so what we recommend is you cut the vine low to the ground and then you cut up as high as you can reach on the vine. Uh, we do not recommend pulling the vine off of the vegetation. There are several reasons for this. One is it can damage the branches of the tree that it's growing on. And the second is it risks dropping dead branches that might be held up by the vine above your head. And if you start pulling on that vine, trying to get it down, you might end up dropping those dead branches on your head. Um, once the vine is cut, uh, it is going to die and it will loosen up and fall eventually from the tree. Uh, you can gently try to unwind it a little bit, but again, be very, very careful about that risk of dead branches dropping. Uh, when we do vine removals with our volunteer crew, everyone wears a hard hat um, to avoid having any kind of problems with that. Um, also, so, when you do the cut, you cut everything up as high as you can reach. You cut everything down as low to the ground as you can. Um, when to do this? Uh, July and August uh, before the fruit ripens. So if you do it early in the spring, often it will just continue to grow and put new shoots out. July and August is a good time because it's already put taken all of the resources that was stored in its roots over the winter and used it to flush out the leaves and to uh, flower. And so you're hitting it right after it's expended all of those resources doing that, but before it's got ripe fruit. Um, okay, Brent. Next is another vine. Uh, and this one is called Mile a Minute. And uh, some of you may see this, some of you not. It's more, I think, I'm pretty sure it's more abundant in New Jersey than it is, uh, certainly than it is up in, in my area of Dutchess County. But this is a trailing vine and just creates, you can see it over here, this like thick blanket over other vegetation. But really what it's known for, and it's actually pretty easy to ID, is it's like equilateral triangle leaf shape that you can see in this picture here. And I've got a picture, I've got a field ID video of, uh, up close uh, in a potted version of it in a second. But essentially it's a self-pollinating plant. 
uh, meaning that it needs no assistance to produce flowers, fruits, and seeds. It's got high seed output, multiple dispersal mechanisms. So birds, ants, chipmunks, deer um, will all eat this and spread this. Um, it's got very buoyant fruit as well, which means that it can be dispersed by water. And one of its distinguishing features, as I'll show you in the video, is that it uses barbs, these tiny little like prickles, to basically climb up things and find most suitable conditions. And it's really this dense mat that it's forming that smothers low-lying vegetation and seedlings. So I'm gonna give you guys a closer look at what mile a minute looks like in a potted version. I did, actually didn't have a, couldn't find it out in on the trails, but you may have it in your own trail corridor. It's going to appear very shortly. You can look at look at it in a natural area, but I do look at the same, same area as I pointed out before. I could not find mile a minute around me in a natural area, but I do have a potted version of it. So you can really see that triangular leaf is going to be your main key for mile a minute. And if I zoom in, I just wanted to show you the level of detail on these prickles that run all along that leaf stalk, right? And I can feel it even at the base of this leaf here if I turn it around. There's also these like finest prickles as I run, run my thumb along it. If I follow that leaf stalk down, you'll see that like nice feature that stipule at the base of the leaf stalk it's rounded so these are really the key features that are going to distinguish mile a minute triangular leaves prickles along each leaf stalk and then these roundish features uh, as a stipule at the base of that leaf stalk so again just the zoomed out version of it and this is going to be crawling along creating dense mats if you found that in a natural area along your trail section all right so that's it's one of the easier ones to id uh, because of that really unique leaf shape. So just to summarize, you've got these triangular leaves. The petioles themselves are like the stem, you know, it's where the leaves attach or whatever. They have these curved prickles along the stem and the leaf stalks. And they're mint green in color as well. And also this sort of like roundish feature here where, uh, around the joints. It's a round leaf-like stipule as well. Um, I also want to point out that the blueberries that appear in late summer are actually really obvious as well. They're kind of, they, they are a nice feature of the plants, but you might see these coming out and ripening in late summer. They're very distinctive. All right, Linda. Okay, so this is actually a really good one to work on. Um, if any of you do see this on your trail, most likely it won't be extremely abundant. Um, it is widespread throughout our region, but it's not everywhere. And so if you don't have it on your trail, this is going to be one uh, that you would keep your eyes open for. Uh, when you pull it, it wilts and dies immediately. Um, it's an annual plant, which means it does not come back from the roots next year. So all you have to do is pull it up and leave it there. Um, so the best thing to do is to get it before the fruits are ripe. Unfortunately, the fruits ripen pretty early in the season. They, they start to ripen in early July. Uh, so that you would want to try to get it out, get out there and check your trail uh, soon to see if it's on your trail and get rid of it right away. Um, so this one is a very satisfying one to take care of. As soon as you pull it, it just wilts and dies. Hey, Brent. All right, last two guys. We may run a little over time, but um, if you've got to cut out right at 8.30, um, I will make, a, this will all be available for you guys to rewatch um, if you've got to cut out right at 8.30, but we're getting there, we're almost there. Uh, the last two are herbaceous plants uh, or like a little bit more flexible than some of the woodier ones we've been talking about. And I'm sure you've seen garlic mustard. You probably have it on your property and certainly along the trails, it's like ubiquitous. Um, it is what is called a biennial meaning that it has two years of, of growth in it. And actually the differences in the years can be quite, can really be quite different. You can all see all of its various forms here. This is what it looks like in its first year of growth or the, its rosettes. And then it starts to like what is called bolt upright and then have more triangular shapes, to the leaves. It's a member of the mustard family as well. You can maybe recognize it by its white flowers. It's probably done flowering. I mean, I have a couple in my property right now in uh, Dutchess um, County in New York that still are flowering. But just another close look at it, two years of growth. The first year, it's like rounded, shallow, kind of like a U shape to it. 
uh, very variable in size. Like some of them I had are like as big as my head. And then some of them are just like, I don't know, like maybe a couple of my thumbs length width. Um, but then what it does this thing in the second year where it bolts upright and look, look at the difference in the leaf shape. It's like really, really different. It's more triangular much, um, than that rosette form that it has in its first year. And then eventually it'll actually lose its leaves and it'll have, you'll see these white flowers on it. And you'll see what are called these like saliques, which are basically where the seeds are. And it, um, as I'll show you in a second, it actually reproduces through like ballistic propulsion where the seeds kind of like burst out of here. But this is what an infestation of garlic mustard can look like in various forms. There's really an absence of uh, natural controls in North America. In fact, I, I believe it's toxic to a lot of the caterpillars, uh, native caterpillars in our region. Um, it's a, it can self-fertilize, really high seed production and long-term viability. I had mentioned the ballistic propulsion of the seeds, which is just sort of an interesting fact that I'd like to tell people. Uh, but it can create these like very dense stands uh, that can control light, water, and nutrients and really outcompete a lot of our native herbs in the area. Um, it can be transported by hikers, small mammals, and through water as well. And it's a nasty thing because it, it releases uh, allelopathic toxins, which basically are like these toxins that help inhibit competitors' growth around it, making it for another like a formidable invasive and why it can form these dense monocultures. So uh, this video I'm going to show you is just from a few weeks ago. So it's, uh, it's pretty recent, but this is what a field of garlic mustard would look like. Here is a whole field of garlic mustard. And you can tell it, um, again, that remember that garlic mustard, as I said in the PowerPoint, is a biennial plant. And so it has two distinct years that look completely different from one another. So I'm filming this towards the end of May, and you can see the second year of garlic mustard. It grows almost straight up in the air. Um, the leaves on it are actually pretty triangular and you can tell that is garlic mustard just by crunching it up in your hands smelling it yep smells like garlic and you can see that the white flowers are pretty prevalent on it right now what these are here are these are called saliques um this kind of like stalk like appearance to it and uh they will uh they contain the seeds and they actually have ballistic propulsion and will shoot the seeds out um eventually once, um, very soon, this will actually die off and then it'll just sort of like leave behind the stalks of this. They'll turn sort of a brownish color and then you won't be able to recognize it towards the end of the summer, early fall. But right now is a great time to view and see garlic mustard. And you can see it's just totally taken over the uh, ground cover here. I also wanted to point out what his first year of growth looks like. This is the rosette stage. So in his first year of growth, it's much lower to the ground. Um, you know, this is a couple of inches off the ground here. Um, and this is like a huge rosette. But you can see that it's more like U-shaped or like almost like horseshoe shaped. The straw, that sort of sense of um, smell of garlic is even stronger on this now if you crush this up. But you're really looking for that like U-shaped to its first year of growth. Sometimes they'll be really big like this, but you can see like right next to it, some of the other rosettes are much, much smaller. So just a couple of different things to be on the lookout for when you're thinking about garlic mustard and looking for it. So first year and then a second year of growth looks actually really different. Second year, much more triangular leaves. In the first year of growth, it's really like more of like U-shaped, horseshoe-shaped, or many people say like kidney-shaped look to it. So just a couple of... All right, so that's garlic mustard for you. And um, again, you know, I, I'm not going to go into it much more. I, I'm, I'm sure many of you guys have seen it or can recognize it. I'm going to turn it over to Linda now for how to deal with it. Okay, uh, because garlic mustard produces a toxin, a chemical from its leaves and its roots, uh, this is one that you don't want to leave on site if possible. Uh, so remember I mentioned that you would want to take garbage bags out with you? This is the one that you would want to carry out if possible. I mean, sometimes you're going to have too much. You're not going to be able to carry it out. But um, if you only have, are dealing with a small enough patch, bag it and remove it if you can. Um, it also can develop ripe seeds 
even when it's pulled and it's only flowering. So that's another problem with leaving it on site is if you just pull it and leave it there, it can go ahead and develop ripe seeds from a, a flower that's just flowering at that point. It, because it is a biennial, um, if you can catch it before it sets seed and pull it, uh, then you've prevented that year's seed from going into the seed bank. Um, <coughs> so you would just wanna pull it every year uh, until it's gone. Um, it takes about three to six years. Make sure to brush any seeds off your pants and your boots to prevent, from, pre prevent it from spreading. So this is one species that we do know uh, gets spread along trails by hikers. Uh, so you might find it along your trail and it's only along the edge of the trail. Uh, so that's a good time to get it before it spreads back into the natural area off the trail. All right, oh, and they are very easy to pull. Yes, definitely. I've done it on my own property quite a bit. All right, you might have noticed in that same video, did you notice that there was Japanese stilt grass right next to it? So I'm gonna show you a very a common video that's right next to it, but this is our last species on the list, the six common ones. Japanese stilt grass is a light green grass and it's got sort of that like mintish, minty color to it. Um, as it grows bigger, right now it's very young. So it's just starting to pop up through the soil and you'll start to see it kind of like take over the forest understory right now and forming this like dense lawns and patches and it can grow and really blanket the forest floor. Eventually as it starts to grow up a little bit taller, you can recognize it from other grasses because it has this little silver shiny stripe down the leaf axis. Hopefully you can see that on your screens. It's almost like little glow to it like a silvery stripe down the middle. In the video you won't see it now because in the younger stages it looks a, just a little bit different and you won't you won't won't see it but eventually you're going to see this silver stripe in there. Um, just like anything else I mean take a look at this picture. I mean I have been in forests that look like this. It's all Japanese stillcrest. Uh, very rapid growth. It can grow in high light, low light conditions. Uh, produces a ton of seeds per individual and creates a very, very extensive seed bank. It's notoriously difficult to get rid of. Linda will tell you a little bit more about that. But the seeds are very light and it's water dispersed as well as dispersed by hikers. So it tends to be found, found along, along trails and found along waterways. Um, it's a nasty too because it works with non-native earthworms to basically change soil chemistry. It changes soil pH and composition of organic material in it and basically like leaching the soil of nutrients that native plants need to survive. And again, it's just replaces forest understory and prevents young, tree, uh, re young trees from regenerating. So it, it is a, it's a nasty invasive species that uh, you definitely want to keep an eye out for and do what you can to sort of uh, keep it from spreading to other areas of the forest. So this is our last look at a, at a uh, ID but this is the same part where that garlic mustard was. Another invasive species here, but this is Japanese stillgrass, and it's all over this area in which I'm out in, in the forest right here. Um, and again, right now, Japanese stillgrass is just starting to grow. It's got kind of a lime green appearance to it and actually won't have that distinctive silver stripe on it but just to put my thumb down there for reference uh just to show you but this is all still grass lime green appearance you can see that the main blade of grass you know it's really easy to pull out that's what the roots are going to look like um and you can see that there's like the main blades are kind of coming off alternately on that on the primary part of the grass um and almost like look like left right left right kind of those blades of grass coming out really easy to pull out unlike some of the other grasses um, but very very prevalent you can see it's just all around here and on forests around you if you're seeing a lot of this like matted dense grass that especially at this time of year is low to the ground it's most likely going to be still grass and i would recommend so you get the hang of like recognizing what it is you seek on it seek does a really nice job of recognizing um, at the very end, I'll give you some resources on using some of these mobile apps to help you with the ID. But you're looking for that like lime green, mint green, whatever um, type of grass. All right, Linda, last one. Okay, 
So stiltgrass is an annual plant. That means it grows every year from seed and then it dies. So if you can prevent it from producing seed, you can get control over it. Um, once it's produced seed, there's no point in doing anything with it because at that point it's, it's gonna die anyway. So you wanna get it before it, it uh, has mature seeds. Usually that's late August, early September in our area. Um, and also because it's an, an annual and it grows every year from seed, it starts late. Like Brent was showing you, that was in uh, May, I think, Brent? Yeah, that was like yeah, end of May, like May 28th. End of May, and it was still fairly small. So it's gonna take a little while to get going. Uh, so what we do is, uh, because it's annual, it doesn't spend a lot of time producing roots. So it's very, very easy to pull. Um, and if you get a small patch along your trail, if you just do a gentle tug test, gently try to tug it up. And if it feels like it's rooted in there really well, then it may not be Japanese stiltgrass, maybe a native sedge or some other kind of grass. But if it comes out really easy and it has almost no roots, then you, you might have Japanese stiltgrass. Make sure to look for that silvery mid vein. Um, if you pull it and it hasn't started to flower and produce seed, you can just leave it alongside the trail or in a pile um, in an out of the way place. Uh, it will just dry up and, uh, and wither and it'll be dead. Um, and then if you do uh, have a lot of it, uh, it's very tedious to pull, right? Because there's a lot of individuals. But you can uh, take a weed whacker or not on your trail, you can't use motorized uh, equipment, but you know, the, the hand whacker, it's like a, it's a blade that's got serrations on it that you just whack. Uh, and you can whack it back from the side of the trail so that hikers don't brush against it and get seed on their pants and shoes and track that further down the trail. Um, so there, there's two options here. One is if it's a small patch, go ahead and try to pull it and get rid of it. If, uh, if you've got a big infestation, try to just push it back from the edge of the trail so that uh, hikers and, aren't tracking it further down the trail. All right, um, I wanted to emphasize here, in any case, any uh, invasive that you're removing, if seeds are present, make sure to brush off your pants, shoes, and tools to avoid spreading the seed. If feasible, bag and dispose the seeds in the trash. Um, you might take this option if you've just got like say, one barberry bush with seeds. It might be feasible to pick those seeds off and put them in a bag and dispose of them. A lot of times doing that is too time consuming to be feasible. If, if you've got seeds that, you know, you're not gonna be able to sit there and pull all the seeds off. What we typically do is we try to find a large flat rock to pile them on um, that way, you know, if the seeds do drop, they're not going to have anything to root into. Um, and then you can monitor that pile for new plants in subsequent years. Always try to avoid moving plants with seeds into uninfested areas. Um, so you don't want to take them down the trail to a clean area. Um, try to keep them within the area that's already infested so that you don't take the chance of uh, spreading the, the infestation. Okay, next. Okay, and then uh, reporting your work. Uh, you can report what you've done on your regular trail maintenance report. Uh, there's a other checkbox, and you can then- I'm gonna show you what that form looks like here, Okay, uh, Linda. all right, good. Yeah, you, you can keep talking if you want. <laughs> okay, all right, so this is the, this should look familiar. This sh is your regular trail maintainer report form. Uh, so you can click off other in the work done and then describe which species you've removed and approximately the square footage or the numbers of species that you have removed. So you would just type that in here um, and then click uh, off for other. Yeah. And then uh, if you do have a, a bad infestation, 
that is really serious or something that you think uh, needs attention outside of what you can provide, you can put that in your trail problems section. Uh, and your, uh, if any of you are supervisors, you can bring that to the attention of your chair and the chair can raise it with, uh, with my department and we can see if we can get some resources. Okay. All right. Um, rounding the final turn here, just to go over some additional resources. You can feel free to visit our uh, Lower Hudson Prism website, which is lhprism.org. Um, best management practices for priority invasive plants. Linda, is that a book? Um, so yes. So that is, it's a PDF that's linked on our uh, website. Okay, great. Um, and there's a lot of other great resources. There's, uh, I know it's available online, this mistaken identity, which is invasive plants and other native lookalikes. But I will say that following this webinar, I will send you guys a whole bunch of information with our, our own field guides that we've made that, look, that go over some lookalikes um, and so like a quick ID guide that you can take with you. Um, that that it was really, really helpful when you're out on the trail to actually have some, some photos. Um, and we don't really have time because uh, we're kind of short on the webinar here, but I highly, highly recommend that you download Seek and Seek by iNaturalist to help you. It is a wonderful app that essentially was created by iNaturalist. It is a large online photo database and community. And essentially, you take your phone just like this. Once you open up the app, you can essentially point it at something, at a plant that you are looking at, and especially with these six common invasive species, if there's any doubt, the Seek app knows for sure, almost 100% will get it right. Uh, if there's any doubt in your mind that it's invasive, these are common ones and the app knows it very well. And it kind of works like a live barcode scanner that IDs species in real time, it's amazing. And it takes a lot of the guesswork out of IDing. I know a lot of the surveyors that I work with end up using it and loving it. It's a great supplement to field guides. It's a huge time saver and really satisfies your curiosity. You don't just have to use it on invasive species, but you're out there on the trails. You know, uh, you guys are doing all the hard work out there. You might as well figure out what it is that's around you and, and learning about uh, your, you know, building up your knowledge base of local biodiversity and the species that are around you. And for me, it's just fun. So um, I can show you if you guys want to stay on. I know we're low on time, but if you wanted to stay on afterwards, I can, I can tell you a little bit about it and how it might help you with some of the IDs and even show you a, a little like tutorial as to how to use it. But at the very minimum, at the end of this, I will send you guys a whole bunch of resources, including a link to some of the tutorials on how to use Seek, um, some ID guides uh, for the species that we talked about today. And uh, we're here for questions at, at any time. Um, and again, if you wanted to kind of take it, I could even tell you about iNaturalist. Um, so uh, seek is really just for getting an ID, but then you can actually post what you're seeing um, to a citizen science database. Um, and I can tell you about more about that if you're interested in learning and contributing uh, data to what you're seeing out on the trail to like a wider database that scientists can use. So with that, um, I can stay on for as long as people want to have questions. Um, I'm sure that Linda is here to yeah, answer I'm still here too. As well. So... Uh, but, you know, we're a little, little over, not too bad, but a little over time um, and are here to answer questions for you guys and um, hope that, you know, you can take this knowledge with you and just want to say thank you for all of the great work that everyone has been doing and uh, looking forward to sort of unifying the different efforts that we're all putting together to protect our native habitats. Linda, I don't know if you have any other closing thoughts, but with that, I can take a look at the chat box and answer some questions. Some questions for folks. Yes, yeah, so uh, the question came up, does anyone use a weed wrench? Yes, weed wrenches are uh, something that can be used. I, I've tried to give you guys uh, uh, easy methods that don't require a lot of equipment. Um, Uh, I've tried to give you uh, some suggestions on things that don't re require a lot of equipment. A weed wrench, you know, can run you in 90 to $120. Um, but if you have one, that can definitely be used. Okay. Any other questions, guys? 
at this point, you guys can unmute yourselves. If there's like talking over each other, you can, we'll, we'll deal with that. But if you, you can unmute yourselves and, and ask questions if you have it. Okay. All right. All right, so I will follow up. It's, uh, I don't know if by tomorrow, but definitely by early next week, I'll send you a whole bunch of, what? John has a question. Someone has a raised hand. Okay, um, Brent, can you hear me? Yeah, John, go for it. Recently, I've been seeing what appears to be dying beech, uh, leaves on beech trees. Uh-oh. I don't know if that's something anybody else has been seeing as well. Yeah, that's something we want to know about. Where is that, John? Um, I saw it about a week ago up on, on the New York, New Jersey border, up near Sterling Forest. Okay. Yeah. And we, today I saw it. I was hiking on the Highlands Trail um, just north of uh, Schoolies Mountain. Okay. Yeah, we, um, there's something called beech leaf disease that is starting to uh, hit our area. It, uh, and it's been found in Rockland County, Westchester County. We're trying to find out uh, where else it is. But also some of the beech trees, um, their leaves got hit by the, that late snow that we had and uh, hickories as well. So it might just be that, but we would definitely want to check that out for the beech leaf uh, disease. Who, should, who do I notify? If you can send that information to just us at invasives at nynjtc.org, uh, we'll, we'll send it in. If you got any pictures or can get any pictures, that would be great too. Well, I'm hiking much of the Highlands Trail now, so the next time I run into it, I'll send you pictures. Okay, but, if, but uh, you know, in, in the absence of pictures, if you can just tell us as much detail as you can about where it was. Okay. Hey. Anybody else? All right, with that, I think I'm gonna stop recording. Um, are we, uh, Linda and I need to stay on for a little bit longer just to like uh, get all the data out of, out of this, but I uh, just wanna say thank you again. I'll stop the recording process now and say thank you again for taking all the time out of your days to be here with us. And uh, best of luck on the trails, guys. Enjoy, go enjoy the outdoors.